Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Nick Dunlop. I'm a managing director here at Willis Towers Watson, and it's our enormous pleasure to host this event this evening in our in our auditorium. Uh, thank you to the, the various chartered bodies, uh, and thank you to Professor John Kay for speaking to us this evening. Um, we're going to learn a great deal this evening about dealing with an unknowable future. So how appropriate that we're here in EC3, that part of London that is dedicated to all things insurance, and we're across the street from Lloyd's of London, where a whole financial system was invented to help people manage the downside of risk and perhaps help provide a degree of certainty in dealing with their own unknowable futures. And we are, of course, doing precisely that same thing today. In fact, we believe that the insurance and the reinsurance industry is becoming increasingly important. As our society and our clients look to understand and manage all these very interconnected, difficult existential risks of the day, such as climate, we're taking our own data, our analytics, our insights, and our experience in building resilient financial models. We're taking them from the back of our business and we're placing them at the front of our business at the disposal of our customers. Through this approach, we think that insurance and reinsurance can really help in a very practical way to navigate the present and future risks, and perhaps even allowing our clients to see a clearer view of their real level of uncertainty. We're very much looking forward to the words this evening, and of course, as an industry, we always stand ready to help in a radically uncertain world. So have a good evening. It's great to have everybody here, and I'm now going to hand over to Anthony Hilton. Well, I'm Anthony Hilton, and I'm the uh, columnist for the Evening Standard, and indeed for this institute. Um, so first of all, I'd like to um, thank Willis Towers Watson for their uh, welcome and for hosting this event. It's a really marvellous building. Um, but my main task is to introduce Professor John Kay, who, with Mervyn King, has produced the Governor of the Bank of England, uh, as was, um, who has produced his book, Radical Uncertainty, which is published this month and copies of which will be available later uh, out in the foyer. So John Kay um, was a director of uh, the Institute of Fiscal Studies. He was a professor at the London Business School where he founded con the uh, consultancy London Economics. He was the first director of the Side Business School in Oxford. He was uh, for several years a columnist of the Financial Times. He was the author of several books, apart from this one, and he's a non-executive director of various public companies, and he's a fellow of St. John's College, Oxford. And he still has time to write this book. Um, so, after the financial crisis in 2010, the Queen asked, why did nobody see this coming? Well, I think that John and Mervyn provide the answer and are indeed are skeptical of much of economics as currently practiced, be it from Milton Friedman's shareholder value to executive bonuses. So you're in for a, in for a treat, I think, um, in, in the next hour. So John will chat about the book for about an hour and moderated by George Littlejohn, who is um, another friend of the Institute. And that will be followed by the drinks upstairs and an opportunity to buy the book. <clears throat> but before I hand over to John, can I ask you all to fist bump, or indeed, like me, give a round of applause to thank John for being here and for you to get all in the mood. So thank you very much. Indeed. Anthony, thank you very much indeed. I'm George Littlejohn, and the astute amongst you will have spotted that I'm not Mervyn King. Alas, and rather seriously, uh, a close member of Mervyn's family had uh, an accident this morning. He has to be 
uh, there. He sends his apologies and best wishes, and of course we send our best wishes to uh, Mervyn and his uh, family member. However, you have John for a terrific um, event this evening. John, can I welcome you to the stage? You heard from Nick, from Willis Towers Watson, and Anthony, who's an honorary fellow of our institute. Um, but here is John to talk firstly about, make sure we get our clickers in place. Tell us a bit about the history of risk and uncertainty. We had a discussion at lunchtime today about risk and uncertainty, which ended in a slightly argumentative way with a certain right-wing academic economist, John. <laughs> well, I think we'll pass over the right, uh, <laughs> academic right-wing economist uh, for the moment and go back to the history, which has already been mentioned, actually, and it's quite interesting that uh, you might think one of the things that's surprising is to think about risk and probability in a systematic way is something that developed very late in the history of human thought. Uh, the Greeks, for example, gambled quite a lot. Uh, they also had some people who were rather good mathematicians. But they never discovered or even really thought about the mathematics of probability, which, with apologies to some of the people in this room, is not actually that difficult as mathematics goes. In fact, uh, the mathematics of probability was only developed in the 17th century. And the uh, the story of its development, which I think is probably broadly true, is of a French aristocrat who was a, an inveterate gambler who asked uh, Fermat, an amazing 17th century French polymath, for a bit of help. And Fermat consulted another polymath of the time, Fermat. And in correspondence in the mid 17th century, they worked out some basic mathematics of probability. And it was thinking about risk and uncertainty in that kind of way that set up, first of all, the systematic analysis of gambling, and secondly, the systematic analysis of insurance. And the, the great clubs of London, Brooks and Whites, were set up in St. James as gambling institutions at that time. And Lloyd's insurance market came into being also at about that time, where people got together to do a mixture of gambling on the fate of tides and ships and actually laying off the risks that were involved in foreign trade. That was the beginnings of systematic thought about risk and probability, the beginning of insurance, and the beginning of the systematic analysis of gambling. And in the centuries that followed, the scope of our risk and uncertainty and probability analysis was extended to talk about mortality, one of the foundations of the insurance industry, and to other things like um, uh, fire and marine. And that was where this kind of analysis was at the beginning, uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the 19th century. By then it was extended in what is now known as classical statistics, which is the kind of probabilistic analysis, probability distributions, all the things you're taught if you do a, a university course in statistics or a, a, an actuarial uh, complication. Uh, but at the beginning of the 20th century, there were at least some people in the economics profession who were skeptical about the wide extension of probabilistic reasoning. And there was a battle in the interwar period, which actually they lost. And the result of that is that probabilistic reasoning is now extended to a whole variety of other areas. And let me give you two, two examples. One is when um, the financial crisis started to break out in 2007, David Vinyar, who was then the CFO of Goldman Sachs, told the Financial Times, we've experienced 25 standard deviation events several days in a row. Now, if you know anything about statistics, you will know that you don't experience 25 standard deviation events, and you certainly don't experience them several days in a row. What Vinier should have said, and perhaps what he meant, was we've experienced 25 standard deviation events within the context of the Goldman Sachs model. But to get a probability about the world, you have to multiply the probability derived from the Goldman Sachs model by the probability that the Goldman Sachs model is true. And I don't quite know what that means, and I'm pretty sure it's very low. 
You can't derive probabilities about the world in this kind of way. Three years later, when Obama was in the White House deciding whether to order the SEALs to go for the raid in Abbottabad, uh, which uh, killed bin Laden, there was a meeting to decide in the White House to decide whether that should go ahead. And uh, after the failures of intelligence in Iraq, agencies had been told from now on, you have to express your findings in probabilistic terms. Now the key question was, is the man whom spy satellites have observed in the compound bin Laden or not? And Obama was presented with estimates of that, and the estimates ran from 25% to 95% from different people and different agencies. And at the end of it, Obama threw up his hands and said, look guys, it's a flip of the coin, isn't it? It's 50-50, by which he didn't mean that the probability that bin Laden was the man in the compound was 0.5. What he meant was that they didn't know who was the man in the compound, and he had to make a decision anyway. So the fundamental thesis of the book is that we have persuaded ourselves that we can and should deal with a whole variety of risks and uncertainties uh, using probabilistic reasoning and we should be much more hesitant than we are about doing that. So sometime around the middle of the last century, the concepts of risk and uncertainty elided. And yeah. There were issues particularly after the Second World War when that began to happen. John, other John, can we have John the slides, please? This is the book, For Sale Upstairs. <laughs> A measurable uncertainty or risk proper, as we shall use the term, is so far different from an unmeasurable one that it is not, in effect, an uncertainty at all. This is one of two books which were published in 1921 by very different people. Frank Knight, whom you hear there, was actually a farm boy at Chicago, uh, from Iowa who had become person professor, student, then professor at the University of Chicago. His book was entitled Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. And his thesis was that there was a distinction between risk, which you could express probabilistically, and uncertainty, which you could not. And he argued not only that that distinction was important, but also that it was the difference between risk and uncertainty that created opportunities for entrepreneurship and profit and innovation and was the dynamic of the market economy. The second book published as coincidentally in the same year was in Britain by Keynes, who uh, uh, he, pub his book was called Treatise on Probability. And what Keynes had to say about it was actually very similar to what Knight said. By uncertain knowledge, I do not mean merely to distinguish what is known for certain from what is only probability. The sense in which I am using the term is that in which the prospect of a European war is uncertain, or the price of copper, or the rate of interest in 20 years hence, or the obsolescence of invention, or the position of private wealth owners in the social system in 1970. About these matters, there is no scientific basis to form any calculable probability whatever. We simply do not know. So, in that interwar period, there was a clear distinction between risk, which could be described probabilistically, uh, and uncertainty, which could not. But after the Second World War, these distinctions became elided. And the two key characters in this elision uh, were also from the University of Chicago. Rather interestingly, one of them was Milton Friedman, who actually succeeded Knight as kind of doyen of the Chicago School of Economics. Uh, but as a young economist in the late 1940s, he collaborated with a statistician at Chicago called Jimmy Savage, and together they set out foundations of what is essentially an axiomatic approach to the analysis of risk and uncertainty uh, that has been much of the basis of economics and finance ever since. Now, there was an early challenge to that kind of reasoning, and that challenge actually was exemplified at what became a rather famous dinner party in Paris 
in 1952, which was a conference that was called to discuss these kind of new approaches to risk and uncertainty. And there was a rather remarkable dinner at that conference at which there were four, at least four people around that table who would subsequently win Nobel Prizes. And you can see that Savage and Friedman were two of the key participants there. And they were faced with a challenge from uh, uh, Maurice Allais, who was uh, a French economist. And what Allais did was he posed for them a number of questions. Uh, he posed for them a number of questions and asked them to take a view on whether they would take on various bets or not. And at the end of it, he showed that they had contradicted themselves. They weren't behaving in accordance with the axioms of rational uncertainty, of rational behavior and uncertainty, which they themselves had formulated. This story is rather like the book itself. Two of us in the room, Anthony and I, have read the book, and it really is not just fascinating intellectually and very stimulating, it's also a great read, and it reflects the, the importance of narrative in economics, which John and Mervyn both speak about. Um, we've heard the word parable being used a lot uh, in discussions of the book. It's appropriate that three of the four people on the platform today um, went to Scottish universities and therefore talk about and in parables quite a lot. But essentially this book is a series of narratives and parables about how economists think initially in narratives and then the numbers follow in later to prove or disprove a theory. But this was the beginnings of a, a subject which I know you don't have much time for, George, or a great deal of time for, behavioral economics. Yes, it's a subject called behavioral economics which a lot of people in the finance community have picked up over the last decade or two. And really it began at that dinner party in 1952. But the interesting thing is behavioral economics began at that dinner party not as a critique of, of people's behavior, but as a critique of the assumptions made by economists about rationality. Uh, in effect, what Allais was saying was if the people's behavior in the world doesn't correspond to our axioms, then there's something wrong with our axioms. But about 20 years later, all this got turned round in a way that modern economists have been rather inclined to do, which was not to say if people behave in the world in ways that don't correspond to the axioms, there's something wrong with the axioms. It's to say that if that's the case, there must be something wrong with the world. So that what we actually need to do is to bang people on the head and induce them to behave in accordance with, well, with uh, the ways we think they ought to behave. So I talked at a conference a year ago uh, where there were 50 tables laid out at the conference. And every one of these tables was labeled with a so-called bias, uh, overconfidence, uh, uh, availability heuristic, and so on. I had to wonder, if humans have so many biases in the way, in the way they behave, why have we done so well? You know, perhaps actually what people call biases are adaptive responses to very complex situations rather than follies in the way we behave. And just to give an example of what is a character, well, I'll give a couple of examples of characteristic behavioral economics experiments. One is you flash up on the screen a slide that says, a bird in the, the hand. And then you ask people what it said. And 90% of them will say it said a bird in the hand. Now, who is actually making the mistake in that particular character exercise? Is it the person who makes sense out of this nonsensical slide? Or is it the person who set up this foolish experiment in the first place. Or one interesting exercise uh, was you ask people, are there more words in English that have K as the first letter or K as the third letter? Well, most people say more words that, uh, that have it as the first letter because they can think of words that have it as the first letter. And this is the so-called availability character heuristic. People attach too much weight to the first things that come into their mind. Now the interesting thing is Kahneman said actually there are more words in English like acknowledge than, that have, uh, uh, or cake, that have uh, 
K is the third letter, but you probably don't think very quickly of these. However, Kahneman did this experiment quite a long time ago, and we have much better databases now than we did then. So we could, and we did a musing exercise in the book, we interrogated 600,000 English words and asked how many have K as the first letter or the third letter. And the answer is far more actually have K as the first letter. But does it matter? Why did anyone ever want to know this in the first place? And if you could think up a reason for wanting to know, you could probably think of an intelligent way of approaching the problem. Divorcing problems from their context is actually a very misleading way of thinking about these kind of exercises. And there's a distinction here. Uh, George has talked importantly about parables and stories. There's an important distinction here between what we call puzzles and what we call mysteries. Puzzles are things which are well-defined problems which have right and wrong answers. It may be difficult to find the right answer, but people know when they've reached it that it is the right answer. But puzzles are things that are not so well-defined, and you may not know what the right answer is even after you've reached it. So that um, some of you may have be familiar with Philip Tetlock's so-called Good Judgment Project, in which he tries to look at the quality of forecasting. He selects people he calls super forecasters. And you may have read about super forecasters in the last couple of weeks because Downing Street and Dominic Cummings hired a super forecaster and then decided after a few days that they didn't want one, or at least they didn't want that particular super forecaster. But if you look at the questions Tetlock is asking, the two on the agenda at the moment, one of which is, will the Donbass region of the Ukraine be accorded special legal status in the first quarter of 2020? And another one is, will there be more than one month in 2020 in which civilian un unemployment in the United States exceeds 4%? Now, these are puzzles. They're well-defined problems to which there will be right and wrong answers. But they're not really the kind of questions to which people want to know the answers. What you really want to know is the answer to the much vaguer question of what is actually happening in the Ukraine, or is the US moving into recession? And these are, these are much more have the, have the character of mysteries. They're ill-defined problems, and it's not clear what the, uh, what the answer is. So we're skeptical about behavioral economics as the answer to this kind of problem. And behavioral economics has had quite a lot of impact on economics, but perhaps not as much uh, implication for economics as what we call the Friedman Doctrine, which is uh, where Friedman got to after these kind of uh, uh, arguments. In his seminal work, Frank Knight drew a sharp distinction between risk as referring to events subject to a known or knowable probability distribution and uncertainty as referring to events for which it was not possible to specify numerical probabilities. I have not referred to this distinction because I do not believe it is valid. I follow Jimmy Savage in his view of personal probability, which denies any valid distinction along these lines. We may treat people as if they assigned numerical probabilities to every conceivable event. It's hard to exaggerate the importance of that particular statement. It has formed the basis of most of financial economics and a large part of macroeconomics in the 50 years that followed that. The idea that you had uh, mechanisms for dealing with risk and uncertainty, and in the financial context, you could equate risk with uncertainty, with volatility, and you had mathematical techniques which you would apply, which dealt with these things. But this Friedman doctrine is wrong. We believe so. And we give in the book quite a lot of reasons and examples to illustrate why it is wrong. I will give you one example of the kind of problems that arise in the, in the Friedman Doctrine. Some of you may have come across the work of Nate Silver, who's the US political pundit who's made a great reputation 
by uh, correctly predicting the results of a number of US elections recently. And uh, Silver is an absolutely 100% committed believer in this doctrine that you can deal with anything by reference to quantitative probabilities. So Silver gives himself in his book, The Noise and the Signal, quite a difficult task, which is what was the probability in September 2001 that someone would fly a plane into the Twin Towers in New York? Silver can answer this question, and the answer is 1 in 12,500. Where did he get that number from? Well, I can describe the calculation which he did, which is he says before 2001, there were t and after the, but after the Second World War and before 2001, uh, there were two incidents in which planes collided with tall buildings in Manhattan. There are 25,000 days, roughly, between 1945 and 2001. So what you do is you take 25,000, you divide it by two, and you get the answer, which is one in 12,500. <laughs> now, I probably don't have to spend much time persuading you that this calculation is stupid. Uh, first of all, it ought to cast doubt on this particular Friedman doctrine in, in, in your mind. But perhaps more important is to ask what would make that kind of calculation a reasonable thing to do? And I want to, you to imagine a model in which there is a fixed population of skyscrapers in Manhattan. And there are lots of planes flying around Manhattan randomly. And sometimes they, but not very often, they hit these tall buildings. Think about that model for a moment. And if it was like that, then this would be what physicists call an ergodic process. And from the observed frequency of planes colliding with these buildings, you could deduce over time a probability distribution related to these kind of incidents in New York. But there are a lot of processes in physics that actually have that kind of ergodic characteristic. And what we're seeing here is a desire to pretend that things in the worlds of business and finance have that kind of property of ergodicity, which means that you can treat them with the same kind of thinking and the same kind of mathematics. But it's not actually true. And the reason you can make these kind of some predictions in the physical world, which you can't in the world of economics and finance, is that you know what the underlying structure of the system is. It remains unchanged over time and it's not much affected by our interaction with it. But none of these things are true in the worlds of business, economics, and finance. We don't know enough about the system, it doesn't remain constant over time, and it's affected not just by our actions, but our beliefs about it. Venus doesn't care what we think the equations of the motion of the planets are, uh, they remain unchanged, they remain the same, whatever we believe they are. That's not true in our kind of world. I can see Nick, our host from with us, who's an aeronautical engineer by background, being highly amused by the calculations on planes flying around uh, New York. John, the book is called Radical Uncertainty. What's radical about it? What's changed in, in recent years? Let me give you this for a moment. On the day when I left home to make my way in the world, my daddy took me to one side. Son, my daddy says to me, I'm sorry I'm not able to bankroll you to a very large start, but not having the necessary letters to get you rolling. Instead, I'm going to stake you to some very valuable advice. One of these days in your travels, a guy is going to show you a brand new deck of cards on which the seal is not yet broken. Then this guy is going to offer to bet you that he can make the jack of spades jump out this brand new deck of cards and squirt cider in your ear. But son, do not accept this bet. Because as sure as you stand there, you're going to wind up with an ear full of cider. It's not often you get Marlon Brando and Milton Friedman in one talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, actually, when people come to study finance, uh, they should be acquainted with uh, Marlon Brando before they're acquainted with Milton Friedman. Because this, act this story is actually one which people in the finance sector really ought to take to heart. 
because one of the, perhaps the strongest argument which is presented for saying that we have this capacity to attach probabilities to every conceivable event is the one that says you can elicit people's probabilities by offering them bets of various kinds or indeed insurance policies of various kinds. The trouble is in a world in which we have imperfect information, much of the time, the reason people are willing to take on these kind of policies and these kind of bets is that some people know more about things than other people do. And that's exactly the point that Brando was making, and it's absolutely key. And in this location, I can go back and tell a story that changed the way I think about risk and uncertainty. It was one of the things that set me on the road to all of this, which was getting somewhat involved in the a reconstruction process of the Lloyd's insurance market in the, early, in the early 1990s, and asking the question, what had been happening there? And the two reasons why people might trade risks with each other, one is that they, um, they trade them because they're passing the risk to someone who is better able to bear that risk than they are. And that what, that's what happens in insurance properly conducted. But the other reason for trading risks is that someone who knows more about the risk dumps it on someone who knows less about the risk. And a large part of what had gone wrong in Lloyd's in the course of the 1980s was that a large part of the market had been moved from being primarily about the first of these, the passing the risk to people who could manage it better, to passing the risk over to people who understood less about it. All of these things are work in, the, work in these kind of markets. But that insight was really important for me in understanding what was going on in 2003 through 2008 in the run-up to the financial crisis. Because there was the argument that these complex securitized instruments were actually a way of enabling risk diversification so that risk was being placed where it could be managed most effectively. There was another way of viewing what was going on, which was people who understood what they were doing or understood a bit about what they were doing were passing products profitably on to people who didn't really understand the products which were being sold to them. And we learned in the end that there was a lot more of the second kind of activity than there was about the first. So what more can we learn from Marlon Brando and these mistakes that have been made in the very recent past? What should we be doing instead? Right, so uh, we've titled the book Radical Uncertainty. And we're really trying to get people to think about risk in a rather different kind of way. Uncertainty arises because we have imperfect information. We almost always have imperfect information about the future. We might have imp imperfect information about the present. We may even have imp imperfect information about the past. We divide uncertainty into two kinds. There's the uncertainty which is resolvable. And it can be resolvable in one of two ways. One is that you can attach a probability distribution to it. That's what you can do with games of chance. That's one, what you can do where there's an underlying fairly stationary process as it, there is in, let's say, mortality or short-term weather forecasting. Then there's the uncertainty which is resolvable uh, because um, you may not know it, but it's knowable. That is probably most of people in this room, certainly most people I've asked, don't know. It's an example I keep using for some reason, what the capital of Pennsylvania, of Pennsylvania is. Uh, but it's, if it matters, you can go to an encyclopedia and uh, look it up and find out. So m certain kinds of uncertainty are resolvable in one of these two ways. It may be that even after you've got more information, it's still not enough to act. And that takes you into radical uncertainty. But most radical uncertainty comes because you're dealing with mysteries, not puzzles. There's imprecision about the definition of the problem. There's vagueness about the outcomes. Not all the possible outcomes are known. Uh, these are the so-called black swans, where you can't visualize that kind of an event. And there are these non-stationary, non-ergodic processes. And coronavirus is actually a good example of radical uncertainty. I saw a couple of notes last week that said this was a black swan. 
It's not a black swan because everyone could have known, everyone has known that a pandemic of this kind is a likely event at some particular time. But what you could not do was attach a probability to what is the probability that this will break out in Wuhan in China in December 2019. You can talk about likelihood in that sense, but you cannot talk about probability. This is something that is in the domain of radical uncertainty and probabilistic reasoning just does not help you, help you talk about it. So John, you've talked um, earlier about reference narratives. Can you give us a bit of a background to reference narratives and what, what it means, yeah. um, that, what the language means? I should, because people, ordinary people don't think about probabilities. They don't think, right. In fact, even people who are trained to think about probabilities, like actuaries, turn out not to think about probabilities very much in their real everyday lives. Uh, people think in terms of stories. And they think in terms of stories because actually stories are really the only way of making sense of a complicated world out there. So people frame what we call reference narratives, which are uh, what they, uh, what they, basically what they hope will happen, the ways in which they're working around. There's an incident that made this very clear to me, which I went to a meeting at the Treasury, which was between, on the one hand, a group of defense contractors who were engaged in very large, non-competitive government procurement projects. And on the other side of the table, there was a group of treasury economists, who were people, people who'd been to good business schools and finance courses, and had been trained in the capital asset pricing model. And the people, the treasury economists, explained uh, that risks associated with these kind of contracts were idiosyncratic and diversifiable, completely diversifiable, therefore they didn't carry any market risk, and therefore according to the capital asset pricing model, there was no need for people engaging these kind of activities to be paid any risk premium over and above slight margin over the government bond rate. You can imagine that at that point, the people on the business side of the table were looking at the treasury economists, wondering what sort of planet these people had actually come from. Now, in some senses, both were right and both were wrong. They were just talking at completely cross purposes. The people who'd been educated in the current orthodoxy in, in finance thought of risk, uncertainty, volatility as all meaning the same thing. The business people did not. The business people were thinking in terms of the reference narrative the story in the which the project developed as people hoped and expected it would. But they knew that in these kind of projects, which were entirely one-off projects, typically they didn't go quite as they, they would. There were risks, and these risks would almost inevitably lead to some delays and overruns and the like in the course of the project. In ordinary language, when people talk about risk, they don't mean volatility. They don't even mean what we mean by uncertainty. Risk is something bad. Uh, no one ever says there's a risk we might win the national lottery. They don't even say there's a risk we might not win the national lottery because they don't really expect to win the national lottery and it's not part of their reference narrative. These, the outcome of the lottery is a matter of uncertainty but not a matter of risk. Risk in this sense is something that's bad. And risk is defined relative to a reference narrative. And what I was saying on this slide is the ways in which people throw around language in this area, even though they're trying to give a mathematical precision to it, they throw around language in a rather kind of casual way. So likelihood is not the same as probability, and neither of these things are the same as confidence. Uh, things can we talked about coronavirus in terms of likelihood but not probability. And I think everyone in this room knows that the confidence with which someone expresses a view about what will happen is rather poorly related to the probability that it actually will happen. 
John, in the book, we're kind of running out of time here, but in the book you cover a lot of the implications for many industries uh, in a wonderful way for, for instance, the, the Chartered Bankers represented here, the Chartered Insurance Institute members and our CISI members. Could we focus on a couple of particular sectors, regulation and asset management? Can I just ask, are there any regulators here? Through this light I can't see any halos, but I just wonder <laughs> if there are any, any regulators here. Um, no, so fire away. Right, there are a lot of regulators <laughs> here, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, a lot of uh, motivation for Mervyn in writing this book and thinking about these issues <clears throat> was to do with the very obvious failures of bank regulation. And most of all, that was the, the, the idea that you could quantify the amount of risk capital that banks actually needed to provide in order to, to secure the security of their activities. And the, the absurdity of that was most forcefully demonstrated uh, by the first example to go badly wrong in the UK in the financial crisis, which of course was Northern Rock. And in the spring of 2008, Northern Rock announced that it was the best capitalized bank in Britain. It had so much surplus capital, it planned to return it to, to shareholders. And in terms of the modeling of risk weight, which regarded mortgages, and interestingly, mortgages, regardless of the quality of the mortgage, as low-risk assets, the amount of capital which you needed to provide in order to deal with that risk was rather limited. But actually, the risk which killed Northern Rock in the end was the risk of wholesale market markets drying up, and in particular, the market for mortgage securitization on which they had relied to place the mortgages they sold dried up more or less completely. And that meant that Northern Rock ran out of, uh, of money very quickly. If you think about these kind of things in terms of the reference narrative and what are the kind of things that generate, may jeopardize the risk, na the, the reference narrative, you don't think in terms of this kind of regulatory modeling. You think it in, in terms of what are the things that could derail the reference narrative. And incidentally, you don't think that in terms of that, in terms of the, the risk maps with which I suspect everyone in the fir this room has been faced, in which you have 57 different risks uh, listed, which are there rather more to enable the, the board or the senior executives to answer the charge that they hadn't thought of this before it happened, rather than to prevent it actually happening. An effective risk map has what are the three or four things that might go badly wrong with this particular institution. Northern Rock was a classic example, and I'm sure Anthony won't mind my saying this, and other journalists in the room, that you should never put a journalist in charge of a financial institution. A truly excellent journalist, brilliant science writer, but not a great chairman of a bank, didn't understand the concept of the balance sheet uh, entirely. Um, what about our business, asset management? What lessons there? About asset management, we... Asset management is predicated in large part, or everything quantitative asset management, is predicated on these models that equate risk, uncertainty, volatility. And uh, further than that, they equate certainty with the absence of risk. Both of these assumptions are, are essentially wrong. If you've listened, if you've heard what I've been saying, I hope you will no longer believe that risk and uncertainty are the same thing and you will not equate either of them with, with volatility. Uncertainty is more related to volatility than, than risk, but volatility is the product of some sort of known distribution that we can characterize in the right time. So risk, uncertainty, volatility are not the same thing, and all the kind of asset allocation models that are built on the basis of that are in, then, in this sense misconceived, which takes one rather directly to the point of equating um, absence of risk with certainty. The man who knows he's going to be hanged tomorrow has certainty, but it's difficult to describe in any way his world as being secure or free of risk. And if you think that's a rather strained analogy, the person whose pension is being provided for by investment in, in long-term bonds at current interest rates has certainty but not security. He has the certainty that he's going to enjoy a very low standard of living in retirement. And uh, 
perhaps he might like to think about risk, certain and uncertainty in slightly different ways, or perhaps it is his advisors and the people who do modeling on his behalf would. So John, as many of us here into the dog food years, um, how would you conclude here? I heard um, Andrew Marr asking Mervyn King on the wireless the other morning, what's going on? Um, does this book give us guidance on what's going on out there in this increasingly uncertain world? We like the question, what's going on here? Uh, which sounds actually very banal, uh, but actually really isn't. And if instead of, um, if I go back to that period of run up to the financial crisis, um, when you talk to people in banks, they would acknowledge that what was going on was rather strange and very complicated. Uh, but they had very able risk modelers and managers, and even if they didn't quite understand what they did, they were sure that they had these things under control. If people had just asked what is going on here in the ways in which I described earlier, of what are actually people doing when they're trading these products, they would, they would have done a great deal better. But if I can give a final, I rather liked getting the movies in this, uh, uh, I can give a final quote. In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed. But they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Now that's half right and half wrong. Um, it's true uh, that the Renaissance was a time of great uncertainty. It was a time of great, great uncertainty uh, if your name was Borgia or Sforza. It was not a time of great uncertainty, actually, if your name was Michelangelo or Leonardo, both of whom died at an old age rather comfortably in their beds. The point here is that Lyme is right in saying that uncertainty is what makes life well, worthwhile and interesting and provides opportunities for innovation and new ideas. But it's uncertainty within the context of a secure reference narrative. And the patronage that these Italians generated for the Michelangelos and Leonardos actually enabled them to produce their masterworks. What's also true is that if you've lived in Switzerland, you've had a rather secure reference narrative. And Lyme is really very unfair to Switzerland. Switzerland is actually the country that has the most Nobel Prize winners per head of population of any country in the world. It's also the country that produced Paul Klee, Le Corbusier, Einstein, of course, Roger Federer, if you're into that kind of thing. It's actually remarkable what a very small country of people living with a secure reference narrative can produce. So the lesson of all of this we invite you to take away is actually if you can construct a relatively secure reference narrative, then you can embrace uncertainty and enjoy it. And if I give you my final movie quote, it would be to, many of you will have watched the film Groundhog Day, in which Bill Murray lives the same day over and over and again. And living the same day over and over again is so boring that he finally tries to commit suicide, only to discover that that isn't in the script either. Embrace uncertainty, manage risk. John, thank you. Super. <clears throat>unappropriate description of a risky world? Well, I think we need to do a lot of rethinking in, in business and finance. Um, I think what has happened and what has gone wrong in this area is a century ago, the American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce described three ways of doing scientific 
uh, three approaches to scientific progress, which he called the deductive, the inductive, and the abductive. The deductive is you start from a set of premises and you work out the logical conclusions from that. That's essentially mathematical. It's a method of physics, and we know how fabulously productive it's been. But if you've heard what I've been saying, I think you'll understand how strained the analogies are between physics and the kind of topics we're talking about in here. The inductive is uh, you generate large amounts of observation of the world, big data or whatever, and you can see patterns in that data, and you can develop theories and policies on the basis of that kind of data. And the third, and third approach is what one might, perhaps the less, least familiar, is what's called the ab abductive approach, which is you're faced with essentially unique situations, and you ask this question, what's actually going on here? And you can con construct uh, stories that actually make sense of the apparently disconnected events which you observe. If the first, the deductive is characteristic, the message of physics, successful medicine, for example, is typically inductive. You get lots of, as, as it were, data generated by patients who present. And the third is really the method of law and history. You have a unique set of facts and you try to make sense of it. Now, I think in, if we're talking about economics and business, we actually have a role for all three of these. And I think each of these styles of reasoning ought to be in our minds. I think a lot of what has gone wrong in the areas of economics and finance I'm talking about is we've looked at the deductive side of things at the expense of the other. And we also have, I think, and this is an important topic we, might, we could spend a little time on, uh, an exaggerated belief that big data and large amounts of data sets are going to solve these problems for us. They are going to help a lot in, in these kind of inductive areas. But the truth is we are faced with, endlessly faced with unique situations. Ask yourself if you replace Obama in the White House deciding whether to order that raid by a computer, what is the computer actually going to do? What is the training base on which the computer works out how you are supposed to be president of the United States faced with a situation like that? Um, artificial intelligence is very good at solving puzzles, uh, but the reason we're not like computers is that a lot of what we have to deal with in the world are better described as mysteries. I'm not going to ask you whether a computer should stand for election as president in um, a few months' time. Uh, at the moment, <laughs> I'd certainly vote for the computer. <laughs> There's a question from a gentleman there. Um, do you think long-term bond yields reflect any probability at all of future inflation? Probably give a very brief answer to that question, which would be no. And uh, we don't know what future inflation over the maturity of long-term bonds uh, is. And uh, that relates a lot of the kind of modeling that is going on here. The correct answer to what are interest rates going to be in 50 years' time is I don't know. It is true that I can construct an implied probability of interest rates in 50 years' time from analyzing the yield curve uh, on long-term bonds. But I think to attach meaning to that is really in to fall into the, the fallacy of believing that the Friedman Doctrine is actually true. John, just a, a quick question. I mean, <clears throat> within your radical uncertainty, and you, you, you have a reference point of the financial crisis, where would you put QE? in terms of its role over the last 10 years? In terms of how do I evaluate it on the uncertainty spectrum, um, it's the kind of, poly um, it's back to a coronavirus kind of story. It's, it's, perhaps it's less malign than coronavirus, although I'm not even sure of that when I start thinking about it. Uh, but it's the kind of policy instrument which you would have thought it was likely would have been adopted one day, but to say what is the probability 
that central banks would respond in that kind of way is not a very meaningful question. Uh, QE, of course, poses a lot of the difficult issues about what is going to happen to the future and what do we plan for it that we've been implicitly discussing in the course of this conversation this evening. Paul. Um, since the financial crisis, certain banking jurisdictions uh, seem to have de be demanding more capital, greater liquidity. Um, I read that at the same time, US Navy captains are now taught to steer by the stars rather than relying on GPS. And there are also uh, new designs for nuclear reactors, feature elements of redundancy and multiple systems that were lacking in the uh, Fukushima reactor. All that's very encouraging, but overall, would you say that our, we're getting better at building safe systems, or are we, we getting worse? Oh, we're getting better in some places and worse in others. And you've raised some really important questions uh, in the course of what you had to say there, or some really important issues. We talk a lot about the needs to ensure that your reference narratives are robust and resilient. And we can learn a lot about robustness and resilience in systems from understanding these engineering processes. How do you design nuclear power stations that are safe? How do you design petrochemical plants, things like that? Two key parts of that are what people describe as modularity and redundancy. Modularity means that part of the system can fail without it jeopardizing the integrity of the whole. Redundancy means you build more tolerances than you think you need. If you frame it in that way, you will realize that a lot of what has happened, particularly in finance, but more especially in business, uh, especially in finance, but also in business over the last 50 years, has been to regard modularity and redundancy as bad things signs of inefficiency that need to be eliminated. We've removed the siloing of different kinds of financial systems so that the acute crisis in 2008 was caused by Lehman, not because Lehman was a very important institution that was performing essential services, but because of the interdependencies between Lehman and the rest of the system. That kind of um, interdependence is largely unavoidable. And of course, the whole thrust of regulatory capital requirements um, in, uh, uh, in banking uh, was to remove redundancy so that Northern Rock was saying we have a bit more capital and we need, we're going to give it back. Um, if an engineer were to say, well, maybe that bridge is a bit stronger than we actually need, we'll shave a bit off it, you would not have the same enthusiasm for, for what was being done. Well, on that note, can I first of all thank our hosts at Willis Towers Watson for having us here this evening. Um, I thank you all very much for coming from the three bodies in the Chartered Bodies Alliance and other guests. I'd like to thank Nick and Anthony for their generous and warm introductions, but most of all, thank John for doing this terrific talk tonight. So please join me.